Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm, I'm thankful to get an opportunity to, to speak on this topic. I've these days mostly been talking about uh, education and educational systems and their role in, in what I characterize as a global meta crisis. And so I've, I've been talking a lot about education because of this forthcoming book. Um, but in this book, there's a chapter, which I think is actually maybe the best one, if I can say that. And it's, a, it's about measurement. It's about uh, measurement as a, as a global issue and really about the uniqueness of our historical moment from the perspective of the evolution of consciousness. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk a lot about that, but to pick up on what was just mentioned. So I came to this topic of measurement, which is very abstract and weird. In fact, like I, I geek out on ancient Sumerian staffs that have marks on them, which were some of the first tools used for measurement. Right? And I geek out on the most ancient uh, forms of, uh, you know, sacred architecture, um, which were in fact uh, artifacts used to codify time, uh, uh, you, know, you know, through this through structure that responded to the changes in the sun, etc. And so, but I came to all this from educational measurement. You know, I'm dyslexic, and so I was consistently mismeasured or felt or felt to be. And I realized that um, measurement is uh, an invisible part of our day to day lives. In fact, if, if you sit there and you think about the number of ways you understand yourself through the prism of a measure, uh, it is in fact hard to end the enumeration of the list. Um, and many of these things are in fact very recent. So people don't realize that the use of a number to mark our chronological age is something that did not begin on a wide scale until after the Civil War. So that's less than 200 years ago. It used to be you were the eldest, you were the youngest, you were born before or after this major historical marker such as the flood. Um, but the knowledge and the need to know your exact numerical age, let alone your precise birthday, you know, that's an artifact of our bureaucracy. Um, age is one of those things. It's a number we apply to ourselves. It's a measure of chronological time. Uh, weight is another one. There's a very direct correlation between the availability of the bathroom scale, uh, the mass-produced bathroom scale after World War II and anorexia. So I started to see how measures are everywhere and they establish these feedback loops. Uh, and uh, today, in a nutshell, what I'm gonna talk about is the fact that we are witnessing the birth of the first ever planetary scale measurement Metastructure. So it's a mouthful and probably one of the worst titles for an academic paper I've ever penned, but it's like a very pre precise kind of description of it. So let me get my slides going. Um, <clears throat> so this issue of planetary scale measurement is actually quite old. Um, you know, I would argue that humans have been trying to measure the entire world. Uh, since we became humans. Um, you know, the first attempt to build this thing, which is to say, to build a measurement instrument as big as the earth and to try to measure the whole earth and everything on it, <laughs> which is what we're trying to do with our increasingly omniscient um, and artificially intelligence enhanced scanners and sensor networks that just encircle the earth and upload it all to the cloud. So I'm going to be talking about Benjamin Bratton's notion of the planetary scale computational stack. Um, and the first attempt at something like that was the Tower of Babel, which you may recall was a failed project. Um, and this is a picture of that, it was very famous. Uh, so the thing to note here, which is interesting, uh, is at the bottom of this picture, you see the king and you see one of the workmen addressing the king's foot. Now, it looks like he is, in a sense, worshiping the king, but what he's actually doing is getting the measure of the king's foot. And this, in a very concrete way, shows us the relationship between measure and power, uh, even in the ancient world. Um, and so I'm going to trace a little bit of the arc of the history of consciousness and the evolution of measurement um, and the relationship between those. And to move from anthropocentric measurement to 
totally abstract geocentric measurement and back again through postmodernism. So we're going to get there. But we start with the Tower of Babel, which is really about this project to build a map, to basically make the planet into a giant building and make it uh, beautiful enough and tall enough to, you know, to either invite God down to hang out in the temple or to, to visit him directly. And so now, since then, it's, it's been a mess. Um, uh, measurement has been a problem, and measurement has been an issue of social justice since the beginning, right? So note here, the archetype of justice, right? What does she hold? <laughs> she holds an instrument of measurement and an instrument of violence. This is very significant. Um, and uh, a theme that we were recurring throughout the lecture is this relationship between measurement and violence, um, but also the relationship between measurement and justice, right? Which is to say that true justice, as the archetype implies, true justice is about seeing objectively and about weighing appropriately in a considered judgment uh, the, what, what is just, what is correct. Um, and then, of course, having the sovereignty and the power to enforce that. So this is what you're getting with this relationship between measurement and justice. So back to educational measurement, this is a picture of Michelle Rhee. She is the kind of infamous um, one-time superintendent of the Washington DC schools. And she represents in some ways kind of the epitome of the worst of no child left behind. She used standardized tests to just you know, gut schools and fire teachers mercilessly. Um, and this picture is interesting for a number of reasons. One is that it shows directly the relationship between measurement and violence within a single instrument, right? So what's she doing there? She's mimicking the classic school marm who will wrap you on the knuckles with the ruler, right? <laughs> so it's something very poignant here about uh, the double symbolism that the, in this case, measurement and violence are literally united <laughs> in the yardstick. Um, and I would say they are so in the standardized test. There's a coercion to especially multiple choice standardized testing that we take for granted. But in fact, it's a blunt instrument. It's just the sharp end of a stick. So one way to think about how measurement is violent by its nature. Now, not everything violent is bad, like surgery is violent, right? Um, uh, Self-defense can be violent. Some forms of science are violent. So I'm not making necessarily a value judgment on violence. But what I am saying is that if we are going to use a measurement instrument, we have to think like we're acting surgically and not like this is a, a, a free intervention. This is actually measurement always does something. And this is where we return to this. So we need to be careful what we measure. But one way to think about the nature of violence and measurement is that it measure allows us to impinge upon organic form. So I'm gonna use an example from architecture. So this is a city from the 1300s in Europe. I believe it's in, in Belgium. Uh, and this city trafficked a ton of commodities uh, and it was like a, an economic hub. Uh, and it looks actually remarkably like a, uh, a cell. <laughs> it looks actually very organic and it formed very organically. Um, and in medieval times, there was mass amounts of metrological pluralism within Europe as a whole, which is to say every kingdom had a different king with a different size foot <laughs> and they use different scales etc and so in fact this was a place where many measures were brought together in a centralized marketplace but the point is there was no standardized measure now you look at chicago in 18, 1852 so this is a very different city the only thing organic is actually the, the river that's winding through it and that river was shaped about as much as it could be possibly by human construction and so the idea that, in fact, you need to structure it this way to run commodities you know, per unit through efficiently is actually wrong. It's been shown economically that some of these old cities, relatively, relatively in terms of population, trafficked in just as many commodities. Right? So what's the logic behind structuring Chicago this way? It's a very interesting question. <coughs> it's predicated upon modern surveying techniques and radically standardized measures such that you know the city blocks are identical <laughs> therefore you can lay down this many you know sidewalk squares per block so you can plan whole 
architecture, whole cityscapes from a hotel room. <laughs> uh, based on the standardization that was taken for granted by 1852 in Chicago. Now, the relationship between measurement and violence here has to do with the fact that the reason Chicago is structured this way, and this is uh, an argument that's laid out in the book called Seeing Like a State, which I recommend, which is a guy's last name is Scott. The argument here is that it's structured like this actually to quell any possibility of worker dissent through violent uprising. In this city, everyone has a legible address and every corridor can be uh, populated with a uh, police force. So we can find you and we can stop you and your buddies from getting out of hand. <laughs> uh, and this was an architectural style that was uh, pioneered after the French Revolution, um, especially by Napoleon. And it was one of the reasons that the metric system was actually spread throughout Europe. Uh, the metric system, which is the first example of a world-centric measurement practice, but not a world-centric measurement metastructure. We'll get to that. But the metric system was spread on the end, it, the metric system was spread around the world on the end of a bayonet. That's one way to read it. There's many. It's a very complex history of measurement. So there's many narratives, but one of them has to do with standardizing military equipment <laughs> and standardizing the location uh, of every person in the city. So the census, as I mentioned at the outset, your actual chronological age, the whole measurement logic gets turned on the human late in modernity and into post-modernity. But at first, it's just the land and the commodity production systems. But what is measurement? Right? So this is Vermeer. This is uh, a woman holding a balance. So what's interesting about this is actually the picture behind her, the, the painting within the painting, is the judgment of Christ when he comes back, right? And what's Christ holding? He's holding a scale and a sword. <laughs> and so there she stands in the shadow of that picture, holding her own scale, of course, without a sword, right? So the issue of where is the sovereign behind this scale? And it's actually the burgeoning nation state uh, at the beginning of the capitalist uh, world system. So, but what measurement is, is a lot of things. Um, but what we're seeing here is one of the most practical uses of measurement. Before the advances of, into science where we created measures just for the sake of understanding things, measures were primarily created just for practical usage. Um, so in this case, she's probably engaged in some kind of economic transaction around the weight of the gold and the jewels. So pre-modern measures, so I'm going to give a little tour here so that we don't think measurement has always been one thing. Um, in fact, we inherit this massive legacy of measures, and those of us innovating at the edge of measurement technique in technology uh, should be aware of where this came from. And we could actually repeat terrible mistakes. <laughs> you know. Um, so, uh, yes. So... This figure here is interesting. It's a metrological relief um, that they're dating here about uh, 8th century BC. And this would have been a common artifact on most ancient kind of uh, construction sites. And so what this is, is it codifies the anthropocentric dimensions of all the key things that need to be measured, <laughs> right? And so this is how it began. It didn't begin with the International Standards Organization, which I'll get to, um, uh, nor with the metric system, uh, with a scientifically refined length of the meter by wave, you know, they refine the length of the meter by wavelength of light. That's how precise it is. It wasn't like that. You had unity at the work site, uh, maybe unity at the city at best in terms of metrological convention. And then one of the things you do if you're a new ruler, of course, you step in and you change it all because that's one of the things you can do. The, the relation between measurement and power is such that the rulers make the rulers. Right. All right, so pre-modern measure looks like that. It was anthropocentric. Um, and what's so interesting about the result of the all pre-modern measures being anthropocentric is that there's a certain sacred unity to all ancient architectural sites because they all have these similar dimensionalities which have to do with the proportions of the human body. Right, so that's the, the golden mean, right? 
And so you find those patterns in pre-modern forms of architecture, which are actually somehow profoundly aesthetically pleasing. And so, as I said, we go from anthropocentric to totally abstract geocentric and back again. What I'm saying is that the metamodern or integral way of thinking about measurement has to do with a return to the human scale and a concern for proportionalities and ratios that, that are humane, right? Because the measures of pure abstraction allow us to build landscapes that no humans actually want to live in <laughs> and allow us to build technologies that are, you know, um, yeah, uh, a little bit crazy <laughs> because they live in this realm of, of proportions and ratios that are fiction from the perspective of the human organism. So, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Pre, so pre-modern measures had a certain quality. Modern measures are very different. And I talk about modern measures basically beginning with the metric system, but you could probably date it a little bit earlier. So this is actually a pendulum that was specifically built and designed by Charles Sanders Peirce, who's on my t-shirt. This is good old Charles Sanders Peirce. Uh, so probably the greatest philosopher you've never heard of, if you haven't heard of him. Um, if you have heard of him, then I don't need to say more because he's kind of a legend. And he built this thing in order to see the subtle fluctuations in the, f in the swing of the pendulum due to the gravitational field of the Earth itself. And this was part of the attempts around the metric system to figure out how big the Earth was. Like literally, what is the circumference of the Earth? Many speculations, but they were actually trying to measure the thing because they wanted to make the meter, which we all know and love, well, at least you guys, not in America. <laughs> we hate the meter, the long story, right? So there you go. But the meter was supposed to be some specific subdivision of the actual radius of the Earth, right? So that was the idea. We don't want some king's foot, right? We're going to make it one measure for all man for all time was one of the chants during the French Revolution. So understand, to overthrow the ancient regime of medieval measurement, it took the American and French revolutions to codify at the level of the state, let alone internationally, as totally standardized, reliable measures. And that was a huge, actually, social justice step forward. Right? I can go to, to the gas station now, um, regardless of what I look like, what my car is, what the gas station attendant thinks to me, and I know I get a gallon. Right? And if you actually look at the gas tank, like the gas pump, you'll see there's this little thing that says certified by the state, this is a gallon. <laughs> you know, you can thank the French Revolution and the call to overthrow the arbitrary fiat of the ruler to set the ruler and to institute a so-called scientific universal geocentric modern measure. And so that's, that's modern, modern measures. And modern measures, as I said, were eventually turn toward the human itself. And we came to not only desire to standardize the measurement of land and commodities and et cetera, but to standardize the development of humans. And so this is a fascinating artifact from 1931, uh, which is the standardized service worker. And this of course has been exponentialized. We look at the labor practices of a place like Amazon. They're using measurement techniques on, they've got a patent to where wrist brain, you know, wrist, the wrist bracelets actually track every movement of the Amazon worker. So that's hyper measured commodified labor. Uh, so, so modern measures were eventually turned to the human and that led to a variety of both advancements and, you know, detractions. So eventually we started to see beyond the pure, simple abstraction of the modern measures, the kind of monological view of modernity. And we started to get postmodern measures that looked specifically at what was happening in the gaps, at the dynamism, at the changes, um, at the things that defy linear measurement and require nonlinear ways of thinking about how phenomena work. And so this is Jay Forrester's uh, classic limits to growth. And as you can see, um, uh, the, the, you know, 2100 doesn't look good. <laughs> And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, so this is, the, this is the situation we still face. This is part of the, the meta crisis. Um, but it took the exhaustion of simple linear ways of thinking about history and simple linear ways of thinking about measurement, in fact, uh, to get a transition into a dynamical systems way of thinking about measurement. And one of the ways metamodern or integral measurement moves into the future has to do with really taking seriously the the, dynamis, the dynamical complexity of all phenomena. 
such that we never track linearly. <laughs> uh, and we, we never do anything like an IQ test. One measurement in a complex dynamical system, you think you know what it is. That's like going in my backyard and taking one measurement <laughs> and saying, no, that's how my backyard works. Yeah, that's how my backyard yard works on this date in the summer. In the winter, it's very different out there. So we have to respect the, the, the by its, we have to respect what is by its very nature unmeasurable or what demands very complex measurement. And so postmodern measures begin to make that turn. Um, and of course, the turn towards the human and the measuring of the human is also deepened in postmodernism to the point of insanity. And this is actually <laughs> kind of the big warning. <laughs> um, and so notice this one in the center says halfway point, right? That means it knows where you're going. <laughs> or it knows how long you intend to run. Or it has some other relationship to your value and goal set. And so we measure what we care about. And we care about what we measure. But those two things aren't necessarily the same, which means that you can be handed a measure and start caring about something you didn't care about before just because you're measuring it now. Right? Like, for example, high schoolers would never care about their so-called scholastic aptitude. But then for about six months, all of a sudden, they really worry about the amount of scholastic aptitude that they have. And so similar, we live in a postmodern metrological marketplace where there's just this rapid proliferation of measures directed at us. And many of them are about things that we never even heard of before. <laughs> and now all of a sudden there's a number and we care about it. And so this is a very uh, kind of problematic moment, <laughs> I'll say it gently, uh, in the development of measurement. And so, well, I'll say that. I'll pause there and I'll continue. So what do measures do? So I, what I did was I tried to give you, let me back slide so, so you're not just reading that. So what I tried to show you was that measures have evolved over time, right? From things that were local and anthropocentric to things that are now uh, really not local <laughs> and really not at the scale of the human. And that's, that's very important. Um, so, but all that whole stretch of things, all those things we're doing roughly this, they were all measures. Right, but they were all just very different measures. Um, and so what do measures do? That's one way to think about what is a measure, which is maybe a little bit too abstract of a question, but we know kind of what they do. Right? Measures create common sense. Once you institute a measure, that's the new way everyone relates to the thing. It's a shared common sense about reality. So, but they're also creations of common sense, and this is a longer discussion in theoretical metrology about where do measures come from. It's complicated, but at the end of the day, they come from a refinement of our pre-existing <coughs> or intuitions. So measures also serve as shared presuppositions of cooperation and competition. <laughs> so they help us to get along, but they also help us to compete. And so that's important. In general, they are part of what's on the table between us. Right? So you can think about the third party present at all human interaction you know, the symbol or the tool or the language. So a measure has that fundamental nature. It's, it's really been part of what humans have been up to for a very long time is collaborating around measures and creating new measures. That's because they mediate between the mind and reality. They're part of what keeps us in touch with reality, right? The, the very first, I believe, and William Merwin Thompson reported this, um, the very first measurement instrument ever discovered archaeologically is ridiculously old, like ancient Babylonia, like 300,000 years or something before Christ. And it was, as far as we can tell, a stick used by a medicine woman to track basically the moon and her menstrual cycle. It's just a simple notch on a stick. But what it did was, and the, for many of the first ones were about time, which is harder to to measure because it's very time is actually abstract by its nature and humans relate to time in a way animals don't um, and so we needed to start keeping track of time and we started codifying it and mediating our relationship between our mind and the abstract objective flow of time with this physical thing that we notch right, so it's very primordial about the intersubjective relationship to reality 
and I'm getting, I'm just going off because I haven't talked about this in a while. So it makes complexity legible, but it can also simplify complexity. Uh, in a scientific society, uh, it they le measures legitimate knowledge. So uh, even if you're not really measuring something, but you can kind of produce numbers that look like you're measuring something, <laughs> uh, you have helped your own cause by legitimating knowledge you're appearing to. <laughs> Pretenses of objectivity around measurement are very important. Um, and that has to do with simplifying complexity. Um, so they facilitate trust which is hugely important. That's the reason that they're so powerful, uh, archetypally. And the history of conversations about social justice is that, and in the Bible, it, God says, please make measures that you all trust. <laughs> Don't scan one another with the measures, guys, because it's very important. Uh, and so this idea that it's, a, it's this locus of trust, and it is kind of the, one of the common, part of the commonwealth of the community is a trustworthy measure. It's the only way the community can work. Uh, and then, of course, they encode power, and this is where it gets really dicey. Uh, and there's a whole lot to say on that, which I'm probably going to get to when we get to the ethics part. So, because it's inherently a social phenomenon, the issue of who measures who always must be raised when thinking about measurement. Now, we live in a world we, where we take for granted rulers and yardsticks and gallons are all the same size. Um, but that used to be an issue of, well, whose gallon? <laughs> whose yardstick? When you travel from one kingdom to another, for example, in medieval Europe. But for the, in general, you have to think about the way measures help certain groups understand things. Uh, that's it. They have a functional utility, for the most part, when they're institutionalized bureaucratically. So it's about this unequal distribution of interpretive labor. So people who are in positions of power bureaucratically, they don't have to engage in interpretive labor. Those who are not in power do. So a great example of this is the tax forms. Right? So the tax form is a very complex measurement tool used to basically determine what's going on with you financially. The onus is on you to figure out how to fill that out. That's an example. <laughs> uh, and there are other examples. This comes from feminist standpoint theory. But in general, those people who are less in power are subject to the interpretations of those above them. And those above them are not prone to reinterpreting. <laughs> and in fact, codify interpretation through measure. And so once you've failed that standardized test, it doesn't matter how it looked from your perspective. <laughs> that actually that question was weirdly worded. And I'm so smart, I interpreted the question differently. No. <laughs> ETS says you did poorly. Um, so by their very nature, the, the measures are usually held by few and uh, affect many. Um, and what that means is that you have these lopsided structures and asymmetric informational environments. And that last part is key. And so this, has, this fast forward to the psychometric backends tacked onto every website now for advertising, right? Radically asymmetric informational environment, right? Where few people hold the measures and many people are affected by them. You just have to note <laughs> when there are asymmetric informational environments because sometimes that's okay, right? If you have a classroom of young students and you have a team of teachers, it's an asymmetric information environment, but it's developmentally appropriate and there's a whole bunch of things that make it work. Uh, I think the situation with Facebook <laughs> and with those types of asymmetric informational environments uh, are in fact deeply problematic ethically uh, and it's getting worse like daily. So I'm gonna switch gears. So that was kind of like overview of a little bit of measurement, measurement history to contextualize what's coming now. And now I'm gonna be talking about these world-centric futures for measurement. Um, this is Bucky Fuller's uh, the Maxon map, which if you don't know about it, you should totally check it out. So I already mentioned Benjamin Branton's notion of this planetary scale computational stack. And so it's this Intriguing, but very, in fact, once you read it, you're like, oh, of course this is what's happening, right? That, that, that the Earth is being encircled in a giant mega structure that is essentially a, a computer. And, and the most important thing to realize about this is that it's accidental. And he uses that phrase repeatedly, accidental planetary computational stack. And you have to get that, like I, Jim Rudd, 
who's at the Santa Fe Institute once said, like, evolutionarily speaking, you can understand a lot of human behavior by realizing that humans are the stupidest animals capable of culture. <laughs> That's what we are. It's like, it's like least viable product culture, like humans are the stupidest possible animals capable of culture. So right now, we are the stupidest possible culture capable of generating a planetary computational stack. And therefore, also the stupidest possible culture capable of generating something within that stack, which is a planetary measurement metastructure, which is the measurement or description of the stack through the measures within it. Very recursive. Um, but the fact that it's an accidental planetary measurement metastructure should give us all uh, some concern. Um, and so that's kind of, in a sense, I could end it there, <laughs> right? I mean, this is, so you leave this whole history of measurement, you realize the relationship between measurement and power, you realize the relationship between measurement and reality, measurement community, measurement justice. And then you realize for the first time, we've locked in accidentally <laughs> a planetary measurement metastructure that, as we saw with the Apple Watch, goes right to your skin and they're making pills that you can swallow uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, that have a microchip in them uh, that assure that you're taking your meds but what they do is they link the planetary computational metastructure directly into your stomach and so and this is all unfolding historically in a time period when less than 200 years ago we didn't know our own ages by numerical quantification. So we've gone from a relatively unmeasured species to a radically or hyper-measured species, extremely rapidly. Um, so that means we need to sit back and think very seriously about measurement again. In the ancient world, we thought a lot about measurement. Um, Aristotle, his politics, he collected, he claims all the constitutions from all over the ancient world. Of course, lost with the library of Alexander burning down, but Aristotle claims that, you know, and you look at what he writes about summarizing these, and you realize that right front and center in the constitutions of the ancient world were meta-theoretical concerns about measurement, right? Who gets to decide how much is a sack of corn, <laughs> right? The miller or the farmer? Uh, etc. And so we've been running on the success of the metric system as if everything we measure turns to gold and ought to be measured. In fact, right now we need to pause and think very deeply about a whole domain of things that we should maybe never measure. <laughs> That's one of my claims. <laughs> that in fact, a metamodern approach to measurement respects the immeasurable and partitions off regions that are not to be measured. Um, and that comes from understanding what it means to measure something. Uh, so this gets into the meta theory of measurement. And so I'm thrilled that you guys have already had an introduction to Wilbur to a certain extent and the integral meta theory that he created with these quadrants, which in fact retrofit a perennial set of deep meta theoretical distinctions. Um, and so when it comes to measurement, any measurement instance can be and ought to be thought of in terms of these quadrants. So this is a simple way to do a thought experiment about what's really unfolding here. As, a, as a measures institute, what, what's really happening here. Um, all measures actually have a subjective meaning attached to them, right? So from one perspective, the SAT score is just an objective index of your scholastic aptitude. <laughs> but of course, on the interior of the individual, <laughs> it is, uh, has a whole ton of significance about their future and their self-esteem and all these other things. Um, so any measurement instance can be analyzed from the perspective of is it ethical or just, right? You can also think about the objectivity and the efficiency enabled by the measure. So if you think about this, most of what we talk about when we talk about measurement is the right hand quadrant stuff. We talk about is the measure objective and does the measure enable efficiency, right? 
So if you were trying to, for example, I don't know, you know, distort an election and you were trying to target ads specifically to people um, who had certain psychological profiles, um, you'd want to know, are we accurately detecting these classes? Are they real classes? Are we objectively doing this well? And are we doing it efficiently? Like, are we succeeding in doing that? You can, you can do all of that, still be doing psychological measurement, hanging entirely out on the right-hand quadrants, not worrying about the ethics or the impact on the subjective life of those people, right? Um, so once you start to factor all of these things, that's when you start to realize, oh, we should not measure some stuff. And so when you hear people speak, especially about the blockchain, uh, you realize that there's actually this strange, to use biblical language, kind of hubris or demonic impulse to create a totally omniscient metastructure for measurement. Right? Like this is odd, I hear people who have no authoritarian leanings at all, but who wanna track every transaction and every gesture and even like your own mindfulness and good actions towards your mom and stuff, they wanna log it all on the blockchain. I'm like, wow, that's, seems epistemologically quite greedy to me and also like you're trying to sit on the throne uh, of judgment and so so we should think about this ideal this implicit and unarticulated ideal of an entirely omniscient measurement metastructure planetary scale um, this is actually one of those things that is kind of bad infinity in the hegelian sense it's like a fallen angel in a Christian sense. So if the archangel Metatron were to run the way of Lucifer, you would end up with an entirely omniscient, inescapable measurement and metastructure of planetary scale, right? And uh, Metatron, if you don't know, he's ascended was Enoch, Methuselah, Noah's grandfather, ended up turning into an archangel. He's the only one who can sit next to God because his job is to fucking dictate everything that happens and to map out the entire body of God that's been manifest and evolving. So it's a, it's a, it's a heavy job, measurement intensive practice, <laughs> which involves measuring all of the material world. Um, but of course that's an archetype and an ideal. And to imagine bringing that into physical reality and making a truly omniscient measurement metastructure, um, that's an example of something humans get chained to rocks and then these birds eat out their livers and you know the the idea that you shouldn't fly too close to the sun and etc so this is hubris um, it's also irrational it doesn't hold together logically it's very easy to take apart the idea and realize that this is impossible so for example would it map itself would an omniscient <laughs> measurement metastructure uh, map its own turn own it, it would have to map its own internal architecture for self-regulation purposes so there are logical flaws within the very ideal itself, which is another thing that ideals have. They are often paradoxical. So then the question becomes, how do we, in, a, in an appropriate way, limit the omniscience? What's the principled way to rein in what we could do? Because I'm not saying it's impossible. No, what I'm saying, I'm not saying it's impossible. <laughs> I'm saying we shouldn't do it. It's very different. There's a lot of things in artificial intelligence that are that way too. It's not that they are impossible. It's that they shouldn't be done. Um, and this is not a way that we're used to thinking, <laughs> but it's a way that we have to start to think uh, because of the power that we have now. And the accidental measurement metastructure is like an atomic bomb in our hands um, in terms of the devastation that it could yield. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, you know, you need to think. So how do we limit? We could measure everything. We could make your life uh, every gesture, every speech act could be measured and logged in the cloud. Um, so what do we not measure? So another reminder you know, that the internet of things is also, if not primarily, an internet of people. Um, and so most of the sensor networks and even most of the things that track surely physical properties that don't do semantic analysis or anything, most of those things are used to track human behavior or human desire. You, know, you can tell a lot about someone by the physical things that are mailed to their house. <laughs> so here's the idea, integral measurement praxis. And this slide contains a lot. Um, and it's essentially unchanged from my 2015 slide 
and summarizes what's in the paper that's coming out in the book. Um, and so one of the things that characterizes this kind of measurement practice, which I also characterize as metamodern, and the reason it's metamodern is because it takes you know, both modern and postmodern moves very seriously. We're not dismissing them and saying, let's go back to the ancient ways. That's impossible, first of all. That is something that's impossible uh, because time travel is impossible, but it's also just not the right way to even hold yourself in your, in your being. You need to think about a future um, that has the best of what modernity did. And remember, the metric system overthrew the ancient regime, which was exploiting people through the arbitrary fiat of each ruler to set the ruler, right? It was, oh, that was overthrown, now everyone gets the same, all right? And that, that's a huge move forward. So we can't, and that postmodernism can lose that step forward. They can forget what was good about universalism when it was overthrowing medievalism. But then, of course, it petrified and it expanded beyond human proportions. Um, and so postmodernism reminds us uh, about the limits of abstract measurement. But postmodernism has proliferated the measurement of the human and in fact diced us up into a thousand fragmented subpersonalities and kind of commodified kind of market demographics, uh, which were fed <laughs> you know, through our screens. And so I'm proposing that we actually, instead of thinking a lot about what we are measuring, which is what we know how to do, that those people who are concerned with measurement and the creation of new measures need to think about an ontology of absence. And this is the work of Roy Vascars where you need to go for this. The result of thinking about absence, right, which it means every time you measure something, you have to think about what you left out. Right? So respect not just what can't be measured technically, but respect even when you're measuring something, what you haven't measured by virtue of measuring it. That's important. When I measure the length of a table, I haven't weighed it. <laughs> so let me know that I've measured the length, not the, not the weight. When I measure the IQ of someone, I haven't measured a lot of other stuff. So say that. I've measured this, but I haven't measured boom, 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 boom. Right. Linger on the absences right, that actually frame the presence of your finding when you measure. Right. You don't see it unless you're ignoring something else. That's actually how measurement works. Mm -hmm. Measurement simplifies complexity by showing you this at the expense of that. So, so the metamodern move is to say, I see this, but I'm aware of that. <laughs> right? And that is, especially when you're treating humans, it's just respectful. Uh, that's why as a dyslexic, I appreciated the special educators who said, oh yeah, the SAT measures this but it doesn't measure these other things that you're good at, which is true. And it doesn't mean you have to poo-poo the SAT, which you can, which I'd love to do. But you, don't have to, uh, right? you don't have to, you can just say, yeah, it's true but partial. And every single measure is true but partial. And you have to think that way. Um, uh, and so, as I said, you need to respect the immeasurable, presence the unmeasured, allow for uniqueness, and uniqueness is actually very technical from a metrological perspective and uniqueness is an undeniable ontological facet of every entity. And therefore, if you can't find uniqueness with your measure, then the whole purpose of your measure is to destroy uniqueness. Most measures impinge upon or specifically or designed to get the uniqueness out and focus on what everything has in common. But if you throw enough measures at something over a long enough time scale, you can find the unique even in the universal. And so that's what dynamic systems modeling does. Uh, so everything has a temperature, but not everything has this temperature signature, which is a temporally unfolding fluctuation of temperatures, which can only be measured over multiple measurement instances over time, right? So that's a way to use the universal to detect the unique um, and not use the universal to detect one of three, <laughs> right? Not use the universal to detect one of seven. <laughs> use the universal to detect the unique. Uh, very different and actually a huge challenge, uh, even for the most gifted educators. And basically at this point impossible from the perspective of uh, design technologically. So that's another conversation. Um, so I've talked about the dynamical systems bit, but we have to think of 
the planetary stack as resting on a cloud, not on a rock. And the reality of human culture is consistently changing. The reality of each mind is so much flux and dynamism that if we imagine the, the stack resting on some piece of like manipulable rock or clay or blank slate, uh, we're gonna do some damage because we're gonna force we're gonna force things into that mold. So we need to assume as much dynamism as there could possibly be, and then work in to find more. So that's about again privileging the dynamical perspective first, then going to the linear if it's necessary. Not starting with the linear and then going to the dynamical when you realize that the linear model doesn't apply. You see, so it's it's actually making good on the paradigm change to the dynamical systems modeling that was, you know, prophesized in the seventies. And then finally, the interiors and ethics and aesthetics as part of measurement conversation to expand what it means to be an expert in discourses about measurement. Um, and so right now, again, remember asymmetries of informational environments <laughs> and uh, the rulers make the rulers. So right now, most of the conversations about the future of the planetary measurement metastructure are happening in back rooms among experts and not necessarily because they are uh, like conspiratorial but because precisely because they're experts <laughs> that no one actually knows how to be involved in those comments so the, so the what we need to do is open these conversations to um, realize their human significance and again start thinking about the ratios and the scales um, and the relationships between utility and efficiency uh, and meaning and, and ethics. That's where the main tension is. The primary driver of, of modern, and in many ways postmodern, is efficiency over ethics. Okay, so we need to reverse that, which means we actually need to worry about what's unique and what's inefficient, God forbid. And not unsustainable or stupid, <laughs> but not reductionistically and mechanistically efficient, which is what we'd like to see the educational system be, for example. So that's the talk. I uh, kind of really kind of went for it. And uh, like I said, I haven't been talking about this much lately. And I didn't know exactly what I was going to say. And, you know, I think I've probably raised more questions for you guys than I've, than I've answered. And this was extremely provisional. And in fact, while I don't regret saying anything in particular, I do have a vague sense that I, I didn't say a bunch of important stuff that I should have said. Um, <laughs> so I'm hoping that you have some questions and that we'll find that stuff. Thank you, Zach. That was really fun. And you yeah, have a question? Okay, Zach. Zach has a question. <laughs> Is that Zach Schlosser? Yeah. Ah, we meet again. It's good to see you. Thank you for the talk. It was really good. Um, so my question is about measuring interiority, uh, specifically uh, well-being. So can you speak to how, whether you think that's something that um, ought to remain unmeasured totally, or if you think it could be measured well, uh, what you think the best way to measure well, being. Mm. Totally. I mean, that's, that's exactly the, the type of measure that I think needs to be talked about. So I'm glad, really glad you raised that. And so I'm sure you guys are aware that there's actually a huge burgeoning academic field around measuring things like happiness and wellness and these things. And so what I'm going to do is talk about how I would approach evaluating those measures and thinking about those measures. Um, as far as whether it should be measured or not, I think since that train has left the station, <laughs> right? Like I don't think we can kind of shut that industry down as it were and like stop the drilling. You know what I mean? I don't know that we're, because it seems though at face value, like we should be thinking about that, at least for research purposes. So but here's some of the stuff that's on my mind with it, right? So definitionally, well-being is a fucking philosophical problem, 
Sorry for my French. And so that's the first step is to say, who is actually thinking about this, right? Are we taking seriously the complexity of what it means to have well-being? So provisional studies in happiness show <laughs> that people who often on the short term are unhappy because they have commitments, for example, like to young children, <laughs> but like their day-to-day -day lives are, if you were like, how are you feeling? You're like, oh, I'm fucking tired. Oh my God. And the, like, but over the long run, they express these deeper, more profound senses of happiness, right? Which people who are happy day to day often have these lingering existential kind of doubts about the future significance of their happiness. But that's not about is one happy or not happy. That's, very, that's about how complex the concept of happiness is. And well being is at least as complex. And so, what we need to do is be very careful when we're thinking about this to be sure that we are not codifying some superficial definition. Right, that's kind of like socially acceptable and useful for people to be exploited. <laughs> that's that's my sense. Like, you know, there was a town in Louisiana that was declared to be the happiest town in America, and it's just because they had parades all day, and it was full of basically very conservative Christians. So yes, happiest town in America. Right. So this is about the definitional first steps. And that means who's behind the research and the funding of the measure. Right? Who's measuring who? <laughs> who's deciding what well-being is? Go ask the healthcare companies who's deciding what well-being is. And if they decide that's good for you, that's not good for you. And so when you look at the fringes of what's acceptable in medicine, you start to say, oh yeah. Like, it, actually, there are details in that question. So I'm, in general, you can see that I'm a little bit skeptical of the current work that's been done because I'm mostly thinking about who's measuring who. Um, but I'm also thinking about that we live in a time when uh, certain definitions of well-being could be, uh, it could depoliticize what's actually taking place. Right? So that's mostly how I see these conversations going, which is to say, uh, I don't want to get too radical, but my, my sense is that there are certain historical moments in which uh, if you're doing well, you're not paying attention in one sense, right? And so if we're throwing measures of happiness at a population and demonstrating back to them, oh, you guys are actually happy. They may not feel like it, but you're actually, and on the whole, you're happy. There's like all these people that you're not seeing are actually happy. We proved it. It is Gaelic. Mm -hmm. That's a very weird and nefarious strategy. And again, you know, like, what are you doing with the measure? Are you trying to get a press release? Like, and that's again, who's measuring who for what purpose? Or is this being codified into a technology that's giving them feedback to improve their, so that's the other factor. A lot of the measurement things are done to write papers to argue about how healthy our society is, for example. So, all right, I could keep rambling there. So I haven't answered your question intentionally. I've just basically said, here's what I think about these things. If I were to approach it, I would, it would be you know, not something you can like work out on a napkin. You know, this is, we'd have to think really deeply and it would actually end up being, I think, a politically radical, radical project. But at the end of the day, if you really figure out how to measure some aspect of human interiority, you realize that live in a culture that is decimating human interiorities. <laughs> like if you can really measure learning, really measure it, like we measure at Electica, you realize the schools are not teaching. Right? If you can really measure health, <laughs> you realize the healthcare system's not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So were we to really measure well-being, we would have some very radical statistics to share. So anything that's not finding that, I'd be skeptical of, but that's my presupposition as a, as a critical theorist. Let's take another question. Yeah. Sure. Um, hey, Zach. Thanks for your amazing uh, philosophical container you're holding for us here on this question. Um, my question is we're currently building frameworks for decentralized social media or semi decentralized social media. And one of the big things we're developing is a new AI for social graph architecture that allows um, users to and people to see a feedback of themselves and their belief constructs and systems through the AI rather than be fed a single feed that funnels them towards an unconscious worldview. 
And in that way, we're looking at what data do we need to feed back to users to allow them to see a mirror of their own world views. Um, and, and how do we do this? Do we allow the system to do it via you know, populating data and relational data? Or do we allow for some user-centric, decentralized kind of tags on specific data sets to feed into a larger whole? Um, how would you approach something like that? Yeah, great question, because there's a lot of these kinds of things kind of emerging. Um, and so I'm of the school that believes you should always put the measurement tools in the user's hands. I don't think that it should come from behind a curtain like, ta-da, <laughs> you're, like you're this, like we did this magical stuff back here and then ta-da, like that's not really the right approach. You, you need to let them see how it works and as much as possible, let them actually configure and play with the assessment themselves. Uh, and that's good for two reasons. One is that you'll end up with a better assessment system because a million minds is better than a hundred or whatever your team size is. And the other one is that it empowers as opposed to um, internalizes. Um, and so again, any measurement instance is, is, it's actually a political relationship of power. It's not a scientific relationship of objectivity. <laughs> it's not a immoral or non-politicized relationship. That's just two people hanging out. It's not that. <laughs> it is a always a political or ethical relationship. And so that means you just think that way. And you're like, well, what if this was on the street and I was approaching this guy? What would I do? I'd probably like put a table between us and show him what I was going to do to him first. <laughs> Look, here, here's the assessment. In ancient Poland, not ancient, in medieval Poland, if you were to measure someone, it was like a hex on somebody. Like you weren't allowed to measure people. And in fact, sometimes doctors would come in when you were sick and all they would do was measure you. <laughs> And, and people would get better. I mean, sometimes, obviously. They probably died most of the time, but. <laughs> my, answer, my answer is very vague, which is that as much as possible, empower the person who's being measured to see how they're being measured and actually to be able to augment the measure. So it's like if you have a mirror and you want to be able to, can you clean the mirror? Oh, I want to get this angle. I want to get that angle. You know what I mean? So the, can you turn the mirror around to get that magnifying mirror? Oh, then you turn it back because you don't actually you don't want the magnifying mirror. Like you want to have that capability for them. And then they feel like they're not some test subject and they're not subject to some magical assessment they don't understand. In fact, they see what's going on and it's part of their toolkit. Um, and uh, so that, that would be in general my response. I think there is a potential to do what you're doing uh, in a way that's quite, quite bad for people. Um, because, for example, the AI comes back and gives them some worldview that kind of doesn't really fit with what they thought about themselves. That's weird. Who do I believe? <laughs> the magical, the, right, the magical AI who was designed by all these fancy people with all this money and I don't know how it works, and, but it says that, you know, like Hal with that big red, like, you are actually a nihilist. <laughs> like, like who do you believe like that's the dilemma you want them to know how this assessment works so that when they get the results like okay this this makes sense and so that means also a general thing is that for as much as possible you want constructive responses not selected response right and constructive response uh shouldn't be confused with just semantic coding for your writing. It's not necessarily a constructive response. And this is a deeper question in psychometrics. So just because you're tracking when someone writes doesn't mean that you've given them actually a selected response item to work upon. Of course, multiple choice we all know is bad, although a lot of people still use multiple choice. But many forms of semantic analysis are just a really complicated multiple choice question. They just, it's an invisible question. <laughs> and they're filling in the bubbles by writing certain words. They just don't realize it. Truly constructive response is one that looks at the argumentation and the reasoning. It's actually much harder to do with artificial intelligence, if not impossible. So what that means is that, again, about uniqueness, right? How many worldviews you got? <laughs> because I got an endless variety of worldviews. And so the question is, uh, what is the classification scheme? 
that's ultimately being produced? And does the classification scheme allow for the representation of uniqueness, which is to say that every person who took it could get a different score? Uh, not every person who takes it gets classed into one of eight categories, or one of 20, or one of 100, or one of 1,000. Each person gets a different score. And again, you can do this if you're doing complex measurement over time, right? Every tree in my backyard, if I tracked it with enough instruments, would show up differently, period. Every human is the same way. So if you're coming short of that, and you're building the measure for some specific instrumental reason, you have to think about why you're doing that. Um, uh, and so that's my other like hard stop with the whole project is like, there's a conceptual issue with the idea of worldview and that you could put me in a worldview, man. <laughs> like, try it. <laughs> like, I bet it's a fancy artificial intelligence, but do we really want to start telling people that they fit in one of 10 or one of 20 worldviews? I don't know. That's an open philosophical question that a philosopher of education can spend a long time worrying about, uh, but which people are going ahead and doing, which is great. But again, this is unprecedented territory. We've never had a machine that told us things about ourselves we didn't know about ourselves. Priests, priests used to do that. Eventually, the computational stack could become some kind of artificial intelligent demigod that knows us better than we know ourselves. And we trust it. And it measures every aspect of our lives, and it tells us what we need to do next. And uh, there are people who actually kind of like this idea. Um, and again, well, so it's, there's already it's already been happening when you look at the Facebook social graph. Funnily enough, I have called Mirror, so just to tie into that. Um, but you know, like Facebook, for example, you know, bringing up the big person in the room is using a ton of data about every time we have a like, an emotion, if something we're angry about something, and based on our emotional reaction and based on the relevance of the tags and based on its relationship to other information around us. It forms a perspective on who we are, what we like to see, what we think, what we're, you know, think we're going to like, and, and its sole purpose is to feed us more ads, not to be a self-reflective tool for growth. So if that becomes transparent, that information becomes transparent, rather than funneling you into a worldview, it's just showing you in the back end, these are the things that you like, these are the things that you've been interested in. This is kind of the map of your metadata that you have populated, and this is a reflection cube, simple as that. And for each person, it's going to be unique and different. But I think it'll be a tool to help people see more clarity what they're thinking, perceiving, and what a system may think about them. I mean, since I'm not physically in the room with you, it's easy for me to be honest. I think it's too late. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's too. I think it's it's too late for Facebook, man. That's like that's like the corrupt ancient regime in the French Revolution. It's like no, 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 no. Like all that shit we we're using to surveil you and exploit you and all that stuff. Now you can use it. These are the master's tools, man. Like they were used to exploit and to trick and to commodify and to surveil and to manipulate without consent. <laughs> uh, and the idea that we can now, now we have access to them, now it's all cool, guys. No, not at all. Not at all. I, I don't know what's to be done. In fact, like I said, it's an unprecedented situation. Uh, and uh, I don't think, again, we have the tools to deal with a lot of the ethical problems that we face as a society. And this is one of them. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, I think some kind of open platform egalitarianism that allows people to build something like Facebook might be interesting. The question of whether people are even interested now uh, because the damage has been done and they'd rather just stick with Facebook and make do uh, sounds a lot like what we've been doing with capitalism for the past 30, 40 years. Um, so I don't think there's much time left. Um, and so I actively work to tell people to get off Facebook. Um, and so I would encourage you to do that for exactly the reasons that I've just been discussing. Uh, so I, it's, I, you know, the idea of fixing it uh, is like the idea of fixing the public schools to me. It's like, no, you know. Uh, we need a, something profoundly different, something profoundly new. And measurement is part of the reason why. So it's not, a, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a happy answer. I think actually, in fact, the possibility of pivoting towards some type of infrastructure that 
has many of the affordances of Facebook, even psychometrically for self-reflection, is huge. So one way to think about it is like the, the nuclear power plant that came from the Manhattan Project, right? The bad guys built all of this stuff, uh, but there are humane uses for it, right? But we have to take it off the military base and literally with Facebook, the military base, <laughs> uh, and, and bring it to a place where the citizens can look at what's available. Um, and some find some kind of agreement about how to use this incredibly powerful uh, machine for you know relationship and measurement. And again, so it may be that we decide that we don't want to do something like this again uh, after the. You know, and again, I'm I'm predicting not a happy future <laughs> if the state of the internet and the informational ecosystem remains as it is. The asymmetric informational environments alone coupled with economic inequality, a sheer massive unrest at some point. It's not just that they're richer, it's that they're smarter and they know stuff about us that we don't even know. You know, that's it's a bad recipe. Um, and so, yeah, so I think an alternative one needs to start to be being built, not work within the old one, but start to really start to build something different and people will flock to it. You know, Bucky Fuller, you have to build the alternative. Um, so that would be my sense and from whole from scratch you know with lessons learned again we were the stupidest possible species to build a social networking site right? <laughs> we're not that species anymore right <laughs> we can learn a lesson so all right i'm going or i'm getting the body language to stop talking so. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>